and we're going to ask um, Emily to come up, and we're going to ask our uh, assembly member Quirk and Lowell and Ray to come up, and we're going to start a little session here. We are extremely appreciative that assembly member Quirk chose to come here. He's the author of the bill. All right. And I'll explain what your what side. Is going yeah, yeah, yeah. With the bill, I will start now. Right. Uh, you're not auditing. Oh well, I guess you're going to do an introduction. I'm going to introduce Ray Lutz, who filed the lawsuit a year ago. And Mr. Lowell Finley, former Deputy Secretary of State for Deborah Bowen. He's also a lawyer. He was Deputy for Election Systems in the Secretary of State's office. And you were Chief Counsel, I believe, too? Yeah. yeah. OK. And we're going to let Emily moderate this part. I'm going to make one request. Mr. Quirk agreed to come here. He's our guest. Always treat him with respect because he deserves it. Okay? And we're going to let this thing go. Um, <laughs> thank you. I'm Emily Levy, and I'm going to be sharing some stuff with you after the panel. But first, I need to know how to drive this thing. I hear you can drive it down the street. <laughs> okay. Assembly member Quirk, I want to. I want to reiterate what Jim said. We appreciate your willingness to come here today into what might not be the, um, the room full of people that agrees with you the most. And I want to invite everybody here to actually listen to what he has to say. And I hope that you will also listen to what, to what the folks here have to say. Um, and I'd like to... So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to invite each of the three of you, assembly member, you first, um, to make some opening remarks. And then I'll have some questions for you. And then the audience will have some questions for you. Great. Okay. Um, thank you. So first of all, let me say thank you for asking me here. Um, and it is very important to have a group like this that challenges um, that challenges the status quo, that makes sure that the ballot is sacred. And um, I can think of uh, no more important task than the one you're involved in. So I have a PhD in astrophysics. Um, I am not an expert in voting, as with, you know, legislators aren't experts. So it's very important that we talk to groups like you who are out here saying, this isn't right, we can do better. So that's what I want to start with. The second thing is, Jim didn't quite uh, describe the bill. He said you're not auditing the late vote by mail and provisional ballots. The point of 840, the point of the uh, law here the law was passed in 2010, and at the time, it was um, praised by the president of the Verified Voting Foundation as an extremely important and state-of-the-art method of auditing. And what you're auditing here is not the ballots. What you're auditing is the machine. So what happens here is, on election night, when you see, as Jim said, when you see this is what was counted, that was all counted by machine. It is extremely important to make sure that the machine is working. And that's the point of the bill that was passed in 2010, that you take time to count not 1% of the ballots, but 1% of the ballots in each race. So in Alameda County or Orange County or any of the large counties, we have many different jurisdictions, cities, school districts, special districts. You're going to count roughly 10% of the ballots. And what they will do is as um, they will take account 
of, the, of a precinct, if that's the way they sort it, or of a batch, and they will make sure that the count that they got from the machine is the same as a hand count. And in a large county, that takes about three weeks. So it was always the point of this bill, as it was passed in 2010, to count and to verify the count, and to, excuse me, to verify the machines. Now, what, the, what Jim would like is that they count, that they do a further verification of all the ballots when they come in to make sure that in that final count that includes all of the provisional ballots and the late absentee ballots to make sure that the machines are working. Now, the difficulty with doing it that way is that we right now have a requirement that the vote be certified uh, for state elections in 30 days and for um, federal election of president in 28 days. If you wait until all the provisional ballots are in, which is typically three or four weeks in, and then, then you'd have to do a hand count to verify that the machine was working at that point, then you're gonna have to extend the time that you take to certify the vote. And maybe that's what we should be doing. I'm certainly willing to have further conversations with Jim and anyone who wants to talk about that. Um, there are 58 counties here and you'll be hearing from the former Deputy Secretary of State. Um, all of them do things a little differently. The clerks that I, t that I talk to tell me that their machines are separated off from the internet so that they're sure that they're not being hacked. Jim will tell you, well, maybe there's some code that goes into effect after a certain date. I can't say whether that's true or not. Um, at any rate, the other thing that they do is they have other ways of verifying what happens in the machine. And I am told that if the vote changes from election night to later on, they will do a hand count of all the votes. And if the vote is extremely uh, close, they can do a hand count as well. But again, I don't know what's done in all 58 counties. I don't know what the right thing to do is here. Should we extend the date of verification? and make sure that that final machine count is right and that the machines haven't been somehow tampered with. Maybe we want to do that. Maybe there's another way to test it. And again, the clerks told me, again, if it's close, if it changes, they do a further check. They've also said that, um, uh, that they do other checks to make sure the machines are working properly. They send through marked ballots. To, to check them as well, things with everything blank, everything counted, et cetera. So they're doing other checks, but should they do this more elaborate check? I can't answer that question. Perhaps our former De Deputy Secretary of State can, but this is certainly I'm willing, something I'm willing to look at, and I'd like to talk with Jim. The other thing is, how do you get bills passed and signed? So what happened, for example, with this, um, um, what do you call it, the um, bond measure? And I haven't looked at it in detail, but when it goes through committee, it's just a majority vote, that's fairly easy. Once it reaches the floor in the Senate or Assembly, it's a two-thirds vote. Typically, Republicans don't like bond issues, they don't want to spend money, so you have to get every Democratic vote. That's very hard to do. There were a couple of high priority bond issues we did get through this year. But even if you were to get everyone to vote for it, then it can be vetoed by the governor and the governor doesn't like bonds. So it's very hard to pass a bond. Um, I give that as just an example of the complexity of the legislative process. Um, to do the sort of audits that Jim talks about, or I've now talked with Professor Philip Stark from the Department of Statistics at UC Berkeley. Uh, he talks about a risk-limiting audit. I don't know what that is, but it sounds great. Um, and by the way, uh, let me introduce Carolina Salazar. She is my... Uh, 
district director, um, I can't stay for Philip's uh, discussion of that, uh, but I've, I've exchanged information with Philip, we'll meet later, and Carolina is gonna stay uh, to hear the discussion. Um, there's nothing more important than counting the ballots right. And I don't know if there was uh, fraud in Georgia, whether or not shutting down the machines caused, a, caused the, the vote to change, uh, but if it did, we're all in trouble. And there is nothing more important than everyone who is entitled to vote voting and counting those votes right. And I think this group is extremely important to making sure that happens. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Quirk. And we're gonna hear next from Ray Lutz. Thanks for being here, Ray. Okay, thank you. Um, again, Ray Lutz with Citizens Oversight. Citizens Oversight took an interest in the elections and uh, starting in about 2006, and we did some research in San Diego and, and found out that this manual tally was of special interest. And indeed, I will agree with Assemblymember Quirk that California is lucky because we do have uh, a pretty good intention behind this law that we have here, the 15360, which is a 1% manual tally law. It's better than almost every state that I've reviewed. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, that doesn't mean that, that, um, that it should be just disregarded. Of course, we should, because we're leaders here, we need to be intent on making sure that this law is implemented uh, according to what we need. Now, I will say that even though um, there were some comments about how much Assemblymember Quirk likes all the participation, this law was put through in what I consider a disgusting manner, where it was put in, uh, these changes were put in on August 24th, late in the process. There was no opportunity for the public to participate and to try to teach these Assembly members what our issues are here. We were not involved in this process. It was ramrodded through by the clerks, uh, California Association of Clerks and Elections Officials uh, without any opportunity really to, to get involved in this process. Meanwhile, they had another bill on this section, 15360, uh, that didn't mention this. And why wouldn't they incorporate the changes that are proposed here in the bill that was already modifying 15360? Was that a distraction so that we were not able to see what they were actually doing? I, I don't even understand. I mean, it's sausage being made in the legislature, but come on now. Uh, I, I am really disappointed in, in the clerks, uh, California Association of Clerks and Elections Officials that they would do this and the Secretary of State would sponsor a bill in this manner. Now, the intention of 15360. There was a lot said about how this is to check for the machines, whether they're having an error. Well, there's a whole like two week process called the logic and accuracy test that they go through. Every county is required to do this to verify that all the programming is right and that all of the um, different types of ballots can be processed correctly. So this manual tally is not to check that the machines, just to check that the machines are running correctly, that's done by the logic and accuracy testing. This goes beyond that. And you know, I'm not really that worried about the machines making mistakes. They're really good at counting stuff. If they're working right, they count it much better than humans can. I'm worried about human tampering and malicious behavior by people in the process. Either they get into the software or they manipulate the numbers. Now they say, well, we have all these safeguards. We're off the internet. What if you have a compromised employee? What if you have somebody that, that maybe committed a crime in the past and that crime will come up to, into the surface if they don't follow suit? And so they're being blackmailed. In San Diego, Michael Vu with two of his subordinates were convicted of absentee voter fraud. He could be in jail, but maybe he's following suit to, to do what they want and maybe manipulate the numbers. Our best way of finding out if there's any 
such voter um, manipulation by compromised employees or hackers, you know, we've heard a lot about hackers recently, take it off the, the election officials. They're all perfect. Everybody's honest. Hackers come in from the outside and thwart, subvert the system. It can happen. So any one of these things, that's what we're interested in finding. Now, if you, if you say we're not going to treat the later vote by mail ballots, I'll make a minor correction to what uh, Jim Soper said. It isn't just the ones that arrived late. It's all the ones they haven't processed yet. So they may have a whole big chunk of vote by mail ballots that they haven't finished processing that arrived a week early. They haven't been processed yet. In San Diego, it was nearly 40% of the ballots not processed. 285,000 ballots not included in the, in the audit. Now, if you're a hacker, which ones are you going to choose? If this law goes through, you're going to know which ones you can fix. And no one will be the wiser. You can fix those ones in the later vote by mail and provisional set. Never checked. Is it right to treat some ballots with more, more protections than others? Why should, if you vote later or in a provisionally, your ballot is not covered by this audit process to make sure that it is not maliciously hacked? These things would have come out. You know, we had a lawsuit against Michael Vu, four days of trial. We went through every little nuance of what they did. Professor Philip Stark came and testified. And basically, if you're going to do an audit, you can't just do a part of it. What if the IRS said, we're going to audit you, but by the way, we're going to leave out August through December every year. Every year. We're going to leave out August through December. I'll bet you the January through, through uh, July is going to be looking good. <laughs> and August through December, you can cheat all you want. So this, no, this, this whole bill is nonsense. Um, we have to get this. Now look, there's also been a statement made, oh, it's going to take too long. You know, we don't have time. In the trial, we documented how long it was taking them to do stuff. They fiddled around the ballots for a whole week with 40 people. It was, it was a mess. That's why we've asked the court to let us look at these ballots. They use whiteout on the ballots to, to modify them. That I don't even think should be allowed. Is there time to do it? Absolutely. The provisionals would only take one set, one batch, 400 ballots. How long can that take? A day. How about the, the vote, later vote by mail ballots? How long will that take? There's only eight batches get eight teams here. Still takes a day. How long does it take to do the original ones? There was only 16 precincts chosen for that. Get 16 teams going. How long does that take? A day. If they hired enough people, it could take at most three days to do this. Three days. And let's say there was big problems, maybe six days. Let's say there was horrendous problems. It might take a week and a half. It doesn't take 30 days to do the tally process. It can go very, very quickly. It's only 1%. It's a really small fraction. Now, that isn't a large enough fraction to really check the election. The only thing that we have going for us is this. If you have a malicious hacker, which is what this is really what we're interested in finding, and they know that you're going to be checking all of it, possibly, including August through December, okay? You have to include that in there. If they think that you might choose any of that, any one of those days of the year, and the IRS doesn't have to check every day, they just can check one day of the year if you don't know what it is, and that can really thwart cheating by anybody. Of course, you don't want what they've done in this state is they've done in Fresno. They choose randomly which precincts ahead of time by two months and publish it on their website. Well, any hacker would know what, what's going on. 
that we changed the law. They haven't actually started doing it yet. Uh, Jill Levine of Sacramento, she decides she doesn't want to choose them randomly. She chooses them manually. I have the ones I like. But she says, I randomly chose them in my mind. <laughs> That's not a good way to do it either. Uh, you know, we're relying, this is a very important process. It's our government checking itself. And it has to be done in a really rigorous manner for it to work. It can work well if we get the government to actually follow rules about how it checks itself. And we have to be watching this self-check very carefully because otherwise the self-checkers will cheat. It's like saying, well, look, when you're driving down the freeway, check your speedometer, and when you go over the speed limit, wave down the CHP guy and give yourself a ticket. How often is that going to happen unless we're watching from the back seat as to whether they go over the speed limit? Now, I want to close because I probably talked long enough because I can go on and on. We have some many ideas for how to, how to make correction to this bill. We have a set of uh, ideas for how or in a technical brief that we publish and sent to all of the counties saying, here's how you can do it. Many counties do do it. Uh, in Yo County, they called me, and they're the ones that, uh, Tammy Foote, please give her a hand. She's the ones that gave us information about this bill coming up. She's always done it right. Orange County does it right. They do everything. Alameda said they're doing it all right. I understand San Francisco does, Sonoma County. Not all counties have decided that they can't do it. And it's amazing to me that they would even think that. Well, really, think about this. How hard is it for a county to count only eight more batches of ballots? And they say they can't do it. It's absurd, uh, totally absurd. Now, we have, I have personally watched at least um, probably a dozen different counties in California, Florida also, Michigan, other places I've gone around, I see how they do it. We do have a good law here. We've got to just make sure that we move it forward in the right way. This is the wrong direction. So I appreciate Mr. Uh, Assemblymember Quirk from being here. And so I, I hope that we can continue the conversation, block this one, not, you know, um, hurt the people that are in process now, the, the, the elections officials that still have, they've had 10 years to, to adopt this new law that was, and some of the dates are, I think are a little bit wrong. This law was way before 2010. It was revised in 2005 and 6 by Deborah Bowen. It was further revised, by the way, by AB 985 in 2011, specifically so they would have more time to do the later vote by mail ballot so they could do it by batches. Um, they have always been embracing the concept since 2006 that all of the vote by mail ballots, and you know, maybe there's a few left over, but we're talking about the vast majority are included in the audit and the provisionals. Many, I mean, it's it, the reason those words were taken out in 2005, as we argue, and they actually argued this themselves in a way, but is because it said all ballots cast and vote by mail ballots. Provisional ballots are ballots that are cast at polling places. They're not second class citizens once they're accepted. Now, the thing was, if you call them provisional ballots, in our court case, they said, oh, you mean all the envelopes that were provisional, even the ones that were invalidated. No, we didn't mean that. We meant the ones that were validated. You've got to <laughs> hand tally the ones that were actually included in the tabulation. So the fact that, that, that we didn't win that is only because of a false claim by the county, which they then, KCO came in to this and got that put into this bill as if they won this part and that the provisionals should be left out. I just can't, it's, it's, it's mind boggling to me that the county, first of all, in San Diego did not say, instead of going to trial, saying, okay, you're right, we'll try to, the law says that, we'll put them in. In fact, I wouldn't mind if they said, we're gonna phase it in over five years or something, but they said, no, we're not gonna do it at all. She's cutting me off. Enough said, thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. And our final panelist to speak is Lowell Finley.
Welcome, Lowell. Thank you. Um, by this point, everyone's probably feeling a little confused. And um, this is in the nature of uh, both uh, the election process being a very complicated and confusing process when you break it down, and uh, legislation being a uh, complicated and confusing process. So I want to do my best uh, as someone who has a fair amount of experience both with election technology and process issues and as a lawyer to try to separate out some of these points um, uh, so that we can have a clear understanding of what's at stake here and what's been done here with this uh, bill. And starting out, I want to uh, make clear uh, my position where I end up, and that is that I believe that uh, Governor Brown should veto AB 840. Um, and the reason I say that is that um, I think that AB 840 violates a, a very basic principle of election integrity, which is um, when you are setting up processes to test the accuracy and the integrity of elections, it's very important that you include everything that's relevant to any given process. And this bill violates that principle by, as you've heard, separating out a large portion of the ballots um, that are cast in modern elections and never checking them and never checking how the machines, uh, the tabulation machines are counting them. Um, we now have uh, in excess of 50% of ballots being cast as vote by mail ballots and a large portion of those uh, arrive at elections offices um, on election day or uh, after election day, which is now permitted by the law. Um, this bill would change the law so that none of those ballots are subjected to the random 1% manual tally. And that means that um, half of the election is not being checked. Um, I don't disagree with the Assemblyman's point that um, the purpose of the 1% manual tally is to check the machines. But that checking has always been understood to be done by comparing what the machine has said with what a visual inspection of the actual paper ballots tells you what your count eye to hand of those ballots uh, says and how that compares to what the machine said. And if you are not checking on what the machine said for half of the ballots, uh, and especially where that tabulation, that counting by the machine is happening at a different point in time, at a different point in the process, after um, the initial count of ballots has been done, the one that we all see when we watch television and check the newspapers the next day or two, um, then um, you have the opportunity for uh, tampering. Um, computers which run these tabulation machines and the voting machines in the polling places all have one thing in common. They have clocks in them. And a clock can be used by someone who knows how to manipulate software so that um, once the clock hits a certain point in time, and that includes not just the time, hour of the day, but the day of the month, um, the software can be uh, directed to change the way the machine operates. And that's something that can be set up in advance um, by a hacker. Um, so 
there is something at stake in terms of the election, the integrity of the election, uh, when you take a large part of the ballots and you exclude them from the process, and that group of ballots have one thing in common. They're being counted after all the other ballots were counted. And that's something that can be predicted, that's something that can be calculated by someone who wants to uh, manipulate um, the integrity of that, of the election, uh, the way, uh, whether those machines are counting ac accurately or not. And if you uh, change any sort of verification process you have, any sort of audit process you have, so that that is not being checked, then it's an open invitation to that kind of tampering. Um, a second point is that I agree um, with what uh, Ray Lutz said, which is this is far from an ideal uh, method, the one we have in place now for the 1% manual tally um, uh, prior to the amendment that would go through uh, the change that would go through if the governor signs this bill. And that's because 1% of the ballots just isn't a sufficient uh, portion uh, to have a reliable measure of whether the uh, result of the election as reported by the machines is sufficient. So standing back from all this and looking at what our ultimate objective should be, um, I want to put in a strong plug for the value of our moving California and the nation to a system of using risk-limiting audits. And that's something that's going to be covered this afternoon. Risk limiting audits, uh, to be very brief about it, are more efficient, they take less time and effort, uh, and they're much more reliable in terms of uh, telling you whether you uh, have a trustworthy result. Um, so now I want to turn to the specific legislation and its history and explain why I think that the uh, reasons that were offered by uh, the county elections officials in their support for this bill um, are, uh, to put it bluntly, bogus. Um, but they're, they're plausible sounding. And, um, and, and so I think that in this messy process of legislation, particularly when an amendment like this particular change is put in very late in the legislative process, which was the case here, I think um, that bogus arguments can pass um, relatively unchallenged. Um, as Assemblyman Quirk has said, legislators aren't experts on everything that they work on. Um, and they have a lot of things that they're working on. Unfortunately. <laughs> well, on astrophysics, I would defer to you. Um, uh, but they also are very busy, and they're dealing with a large number of bills. They're dealing with a lot of issues, and not just those that they uh, work on on their committees. They're dealing with everything that's passing before them in a legislative session. So this amendment that changes what gets included in the 1% manual tally came in after all of the standard committee hearings were held in the legislature. Um, and as a result, there was only a single committee hearing after the amendments that looked at the logic behind and the potential problems with this change at all. Um, but I'm going to be referring to that the staff report that was prepared for that, um, uh, for that committee hearing because I think it gets right to the heart of what's wrong here. So. Um, this, the basic bill that we're dealing with now was uh, uh, passed in 2006. It was sponsored by Deborah Bowen, who was then a member of the California State Senate. She, um, later that year, was elected Secretary of State and served from 2007 to 2014. Um, I was her Deputy Secretary of State for Voting Systems and uh, Technology and Policy for those eight years, and for the final uh, four years, I was 
uh, her chief counsel, the chief attorney for the agency. Um, the bill um, was made necessary because it was determined that many um, counties in the state were not following uh, the law as it was then written. Uh, and in order to make sure that they did, it had to be made much more explicit. Um, so these were changes to correct practices that had been going on. And those changes made it very clear um, that all of the vote by mail ballots uh, cast in the election should be included in the random selection of ballots and in the 1% manual tally of those ballots. CACEO, you've heard referred to, the California Association of Clerks and Elections Officials, opposed that bill, and they opposed it using the same arguments that they used in support of AB 840. Um, they opposed it because they asserted that um, the process of uh, tabulating the late arriving vote by mail ballots and provisional ballots take, can take so long that it presses them up against those 28 and 30 day deadlines for the final certification of the uh, results of an election. Um, those arguments did not prevail. The bill was passed um, unchanged and it was quite clear that it required all vote by mail ballots to be uh, included in the 1% manual tally. Um, then in 2011, um, a bill was uh, proposed and was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor um, specifically to address the concern of the county elections officials. Um, and that bill was AB 985. That was sponsored by uh, my boss, the Secretary of State, Deborah Bowen, and it was officially supported by the California Association of Clerks and Elections Officials. And what that bill did was create the option for all counties to conduct um, a two-part 1% manual tally in which the first part of it would be conducted only on those ballots that were cast on uh, election day and the vote by mail ballots that had already been processed by election day so that they were included in what's been referred to here at the semi-official uh, um, uh, election canvas. Semi-final, I'm sorry, semi-final. Um, and that has to be completed by Thursday after the Tuesday election and typically only includes things that have been um, tabulated uh, by the end of election night. So the bill allowed the 1% manual tally process to be applied to those ballots separately. And it even allowed in excluding any vote by mail ballots from that. So really all that the 1% manual tally would focus on would be the ballots cast in the polling places. It then allowed a second um, uh, uh, grouping of ballots to be uh, subjected to a 1% ma manual tally by a different process. The one that applies to uh, election day ballots um, is based on a random selection of precincts. So you select 1% of the precincts um, and you, uh, you compare those with paper ballot and machine count. This new process allowed selecting the 1% that were going to be um, checked based on the batches of ballots that were run through the big central uh, tabulation machines that all the counties use um, to tabulate vote by mail ballots. And that that solved the problem. I want to make this clear. Um, because the problem claimed by the elections officials was that it took them a long time to sort out all those vote by mail ballots that were received late into separate precincts so that they could then be included in the sets of ballots 
on a precinct by precinct basis before the, the random selection of 1% of those precincts was made and before the uh, manual tally was conducted. The bill that was passed and signed by the governor in 2011 solved that problem by saying you can do the tally of those vote by mail ballots that came in late without dividing them up into precincts. If your machine tabulates ballots in batches of uh, 175, then you can take that report from the machine of how it counted those 175 ballots, and you can take the 175 ballots and count those by hand and compare the two. Um, so that really solved the problem. Um, and CA CEO recognized that it would solve the problem. They supported the bill, and uh, it became law. But it was optional, you said, for counties? To do the, didn't you say that, that the bill provided that it was optional for the counties to do these? That's two? right. It was optional. Okay. And so, let me just let you know we have a couple more minutes for, okay. you, for your what was the bill section. 985. The bill was 985. What? And that was AB in the... AB 985. Yeah, AB 985 in the 2011 session. Um, okay. So when this amendment was proposed for AB 840, the CA CEO presented exactly the same arguments it had made about the time pressure problems when it opposed um, the bill that Senator Bowen carried in 2006. That's the bill uh, and the form of the law that stood until 2011. But as I've said, it was changed in 2011 um, that, to take away that time problem. And there's very specific evidence that this works because um, support for that 2011 bill came from two counties that came in and testified in support of the bill because they had been allowed on, allowed on a special emergency basis to use that new two-part technique um, in an election in 2015 uh, because two elections had been scheduled just two weeks apart and they needed some kind of solution. So they did it. It worked. They both reported, this was Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo, um, that it saved them 70 to 90 percent of the time and the money involved in doing it the old way. Um, but as I say, CA CEO came back in as if that had never happened and argued uh, that they still faced that same time problem. And the solution to that was to rewrite the statute so that only the ballots that were tabulated uh, on election night and that were included in the semi-official, um, I'm sorry, the semi-final, uh, I've been away from this for a little bit, um, the semi-final uh, tally um, uh, would be included in the 1% uh, audit. So um, this bill was a, uh, solution in search of a problem, and uh, I, which I'm bill, afraid... Which bill are you referring to? AB 840, okay, the one you. that's sitting on the governor's desk. And, and I'm, I'm sad to report, but I think that the arguments that were presented by the counties uh, to the assemblymen and the staff and to the committee um, were disingenuous, and um, this was something that didn't need to be done, and it should be undone by the governor. Thank you so much. So, so I just want to check in with, with a little bit on where we are. We've got about 12 minutes for, to, to complete this part of the program. I want to give Assemblymember Quirk a couple of minutes to respond to what's been said since you spoke, and then we'll go into so questions. So had I talked with Lowell, um, and had a chance to read AB 985 from 2011, um, I might have come with a different conclusion. Um, so let me just say that uh, uh, we need to talk further. I need to call the Secretary of State this weekend. I need to look at AB 985. 
and uh, and try and understand this better. Thank you. Thank you. That brought tears to my eyes. Thank you for so much for saying that. And it, it actually leads into the question that I wanted to ask you, Assembly Member Quirk, which, sorry, I'll come up here so you can see me, which is, if you were to leave here um, having different feelings about this bill, given that it's already on the governor's desk, what could you do at that point? Well, first of all, I haven't committed to doing anything yet. Um, there was an if in that question. But, uh, you know, I've got to have further conversations. I've got to look at AB 985. Um, but, yeah, you can always tell, you can always withdraw your request for a signature. Now, if the Secretary of State and the county clerks tell them to sign it and I tell them not to, I don't know what happens. Uh, again, I've got to do some homework before I decide what I want to do. Uh, but, you know, a lot of what I heard, frankly, was not detailed, did not have the facts that Lowell has brought up. And it's listening to the facts that he is bringing up, and now I have to verify them, and in particular look at AB 985 and have a discussion. Okay. And I know both the chair of the committee and the person who did this, they're great people. Um, so I'll just have to look at it. I, I'm not going to make any commitments, um, but, I, you know, look, Jim brought up some possibilities. What Lowell brought up is another way to do the audit which gets around these problems. Now, when you're having somebody like Ray tell me that you can count the ballots in three days and the clerks are saying three weeks, I don't know who to believe. But when you have a reference to a bill and the detailed history that Lowell came up with, that I can check. And that I will check. Thank you. So we've got seven minutes left for questions. I'm gonna ask, there are a lot of, we're not gonna get all the way back to the back of the line. I'm gonna ask each of you to be as brief as you possibly can, and I'm gonna ask each of you to be as brief as you can in your answers as well. Okay, Barbara, okay. Si Barbara, Simon. Barbara Simon, I speak fast. Um, so, just a few quick comments. Uh, one, of, well, first of all, thank you, Assemblymember Quirk. We really appreciate your being here. I mean, we all really appreciate it. Uh, so. The, the comment about that we've heard, the comment that we've heard that the machines are secure because they're not connected to the internet, unfortunately, isn't really accurate because these machines are reprogrammed for each new election and they're programmed on computers, separate computers that frequently are connected to the internet. These computers could be infected with election rigging malware or hacked, and then that hack can be transmitted to the voting computer by the memory, the, 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 the memories that's used, the, like the memory stick that's used to carry the election information from the computer to the, I mean from the Yeah, I'm not going to dispute that. Yeah, okay, so that's not a security form. I'm just gonna say that that doesn't protect the voting machines from hacking. Uh, and I also just wanted to quickly comment on the idea that the logic and accuracy tests capture problems with the software. They certainly don't. In fact, they tend to be pretty inadequate. Frequently, you can't, sometimes the same number of ballots or numbers are given for each candidate, and there's no way to tell if one candidate is being favored over another. And finally, I just want to make a, a comparison to the situation here to something we've all heard of, which is the Volkswagen hack. Because with Volkswagen, it worked fine. Oh, yeah. Initially, it was only when it went on the road that it didn't work. There were, and there was software in, in, the, in, those, in, in Volkswagens which could identify when it was being tested and when it was being driven on the road. And the same thing could happen with these voting machines. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara. Jerry? Yeah, I've got, a, I think, a clarification. Or, um, well, sometimes we're talking about vote by mail ballots. You lean into the mic or lift it off? Okay, talking about vote by mail or uh, directly at the polls. But what often happens in California now is like my neighbor gets a vote by mail ballot 
and she fills it out, and then she goes on election day to the poll and drops it in the, um, whatever you call it, the, the container for the ballots. And those would count as vote by mail ballots, even though they never went through the mail. So that's um, a growing trend. Also, it's very easy as a programmer, I'm a programmer, to put in something in the, uh, just like the Volkswagen, to put something in that says, this is the day after the election, uh, change the algorithm for counting the votes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, we're going to go I through I too want to thank you, and I just want to say real quickly, the Volkswagen thing is something to be very concerned about, and other people have talked about, but they got fined $2.8 billion dollars for 600,000 vehicles sold in the United States that passed emissions every time, and it knew it was being tested. And that is a really big problem that we fear. You know, I, I work all over the country analyzing elections, and I almost want to scream when an election director says to me, well, John, gee, we ran a logic and accuracy test before and after, and how can you, they say that in the age of Volkswagen? Secondly, I canvassed the whole state while Ray was suing, uh, you know, in San Diego, and that primary election was bizarre. The vote by mail uh, did not match up with the precinct vote before and after. Election night, there was a 26-point swing at the precinct, which was, we think, a stack. At the uh, precinct, uh, 550,000 Democratic voters were forced into provisionals because they may have been stripped because somebody got into the voter database through micro-targeting. And then the last part, which was placed, like he said, 35 to 40 percent of the vote was not analyzed, and those numbers did not reflect what the first vote by mail, and the rule of large numbers didn't work. And it screams out that that last 35%, if you want to steal with impunity, you steal where nobody is looking. Thank you, John. Thank you. Let me just say one thing, because it's been brought up. In the trial, we went over everything that Michael Vu did in the, in the manual tally process. On the average, it took less than a day to count one of these precincts and one of these batches. The idea that it takes 30 days is only if they don't employ enough people. They could get, hire more people and do it faster. It's a, it's a, it's a number thing. So uh, I can show anybody who wants, the, he says he doesn't trust what I have to say, it's in the record of the court and I can prove it. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, and this is gonna be the, probably the last question we're gonna have time for. Yes, my name is Chris Trudonik. I'm the president of the San Francisco Elections Commission. And I was here speaking yesterday as a commissioner, although today I'm gonna to be speaking as a member of the public. I've got two quick points. The first is that, just to give people an idea of how quickly these changes were introduced and passed, they occurred between two of our monthly commission meetings. So by the time that our commission met, I, I can only report that the bill had already passed. And in contrast with a bill like AB 668, the bond measure, um, that process takes my commission a few months because we have to work through the city processes and we were able to, to influence that legislation. And my second point is that um, it's been brought up as to whether the purpose of this, the manual tally, is to check the machines or the count. Well, I'd like to uh, draw attention to the, the definition of the 1% manual tally in the elections codes. This is chapter four, section 336.5. It's just a two sentence definition, but the second, the second sentence says, this procedure is conducted during the official canvas to verify the accuracy of the automated count. It doesn't say machine, it says count. And the count includes, of course, all the ballots. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Could, could we take just one more minute and hear from Professor Stark? Yeah. I, I think that would be useful. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. Professor Stark, go ahead. Thank you for the chance to, to say a couple of things. Um, I first wanted to trouble the notion of checking the machines, that it's just about checking the machines. So, first of all, if that were the case, then it would still be very important to do this manual tally for votes that are cast by mail, because very often it's different equipment that's being used to count things cast by mail and things that are cast in precincts. So it's not the same machines. Secondly, the notion that you're just checking whether the machines work 
is really naive. The machines don't work or not work. They work to some level of accuracy. And the question is, did they, were they accurate enough for this particular collection of ballots to determine who really won? So you can't do that sort of once and for all. And the logic and accuracy tests in particular, which are often machine-marked ballots with perfectly you know, marked ovals or whatever it is, are not a very good test of how the machines function in practice. Um, finally, I, I contribute, I was working with the Secretary of State's office when AB 985 uh, was proposed, and uh, you know, just to echo what Lowell said, before 985, many jurisdic the, 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 la the language of the law said you have to recount the votes that are cast in a particular precinct. Because the way a lot of jurisdictions operated, votes that were cast by mail were not sorted by precinct. And so in order to conduct this audit, they had to go in by hand, find all the ballots that corresponded to a particular precinct, aggregate them, and then count them by hand. And that, that first step was incredibly time consuming. So what, nine, what 985 was supposed to do is say, if you've batched your ballots in a different way, we'll let you draw a random sample from those batches for those ballots separately. And it actually had a statistical advantage as well by increasing the total number of batches and decreasing the batch size, you get more power. Um, thank thanks you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you Listen to his description of that rather than mine. That was much clearer. Thank you. So please join me in thanking all of our panelists. And uh, let me thank uh, Professor Stark uh, for his comments, which again I found uh, very educational. And I just I wish I'd been able to talk to the two of you sooner. Um, so I've got a lot of work to do to try and understand what's going on here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.